Hi, welcome to today's On This Day in Tudor History with me, Claire Ridgway, author of On This Day in Tudor History. Um, I also run the Tudor Society. Where am I taking you back to today? Well, I think we'll go back to the reign of hmm, Queen Elizabeth I. For On This Day in Tudor History, the 14th of October, 1586, the trial of Mary, Queen of Scots, began at Fotheringay Castle in Northamptonshire. Now, before I begin properly, I'd like to say a big thank you to historian John Guy, author of My Heart is My Own, The Life of Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, I'd like to thank him because his book is amazing. It is so wonderfully detailed and he gives such a good account, a meticulously researched and referenced account of Mary's downfall in his book. And it's helped people like me write articles on it and do talks on it as well. So thank you, Dr. John Guy. Uh, It's really helped me uh, to do this talk, um, which is based on an article I wrote a few years ago. Now, Mary, Queen of Scots, had at first refused to appear before Elizabeth I's commission, but she'd then been informed by William Sissel that the trial would take place with or without her. So it's up to her. She might not recognise it, but it was going to go ahead. She appeared in front of the commission at 9am. She was dressed in a black velvet gown and a white cambric cap and veil. Mary protested against the commission, arguing that the court was not legitimate and arguing against the fact that she was not allowed legal defence and was not able to call any witnesses. Mary was also not permitted to examine any of the documents being used against her. Her protests were in vain and the prosecution went ahead and opened the trial with an account of the Babington plot, which was a plot to assassinate Queen Elizabeth I and to replace her as Queen with Mary. The prosecution argued that Mary was aware of the plot, that she'd given her approval to the plot, she'd agreed with it and had even promised to help. Mary protested her innocence. Mary said, I knew not Babington. I never received any letters from him, nor wrote any to him. I never plotted the destruction of the Queen. If you want to prove it, then produce my letters signed with my own hand. The council said, but we have evidence of letters between you and Babington. Mary, if so, why do you not produce them? I have the right to demand to see the originals and copies side by side. It is quite possible that my ciphers have been tampered with by my enemies. I cannot reply to this accusation without full knowledge. Until then, I must content myself with affirming solemnly that I am not guilty of the crimes imputed to me. Now, unfortunately for Mary, Elizabeth I's spymaster, Sir Francis Walsingham, had collected a great deal of evidence. This evidence included a confession made by Sir Anthony Babington, who had also pleaded guilty at his own trial, a deciphered transcript in English of Mary's reply to Babington, a reciphered copy of Mary's original letter to Babington, which looked exactly like the original, confessions from Mary's own secretaries. So that's quite a lot of evidence against her. Walsingham had done a pretty good job there. When the prosecution produced all of this evidence, Mary burst into tears, but still denied her involvement, claiming that the documents were a counterfeit. Walsingham proclaimed his innocence, stating that the documents were real. A distraught Mary proclaimed that I would never make shipwreck of my soul by conspiring the destruction of my dearest sister. The court was then adjourned for lunch. After lunch, Mary's secretary's confessions were read out, much to Mary's shock and horror. Mary argued that her letters must have been tampered with after she'd seen them, and then argued... The majesty and safety of all princes falleth to the ground if they depend upon the writings and testimony of their secretaries. I am not to be convicted except by my own word or writing. 
The trial continued the next day with the prosecution accusing Mary of consenting to Elizabeth's assassination in her reply to Babington. Mary tried to argue that although she had written, then shall it be time to set the gentlemen to work taking order upon the accomplishing of their design, that she had not specified what the work was. However, as the prosecution pointed out, Mary had also appealed for foreign help, and although she argued that an act of war, even if it resulted in Elizabeth's death, was legitimate if it allowed her, a queen, to be free at last, the commission saw her actions as an act of treason. As the trial closed, Mary demanded that she should be heard in front of Parliament or the Queen, but she was fighting a losing battle. Sentence was delayed as long as possible by order of Elizabeth, but on the 25th of October, the Commission reconvened and found Mary guilty. On the 29th of October, Parliament met to discuss Mary, Queen of Scots, the Babington plot and her role in Lord Darnley's murder. And it was decided that they should petition Elizabeth to execute Mary. This put Queen Elizabeth in a difficult position as she did not want to be accused of regicide. On the 4th of December, Mary was publicly proclaimed guilty. And finally, on the 1st of February, 1587, Elizabeth called her secretary, William Davison, asking him to bring Mary's death warrant to her for her to sign. Elizabeth signed it, but told Davison to ask Walsingham to write to Sir Amias Paulet, who was Mary's jailer, to write to him in his own name, asking him to kill Mary. Now, this would enable Elizabeth to be rid of her nemesis without actually taking any responsibility for it. Instead, Paulette would be acting privately under the bond of association. Paulette was understandably horrified, protesting that God forbid that I should make so foul a shipwreck of my conscience. Meanwhile, Sir William Sissel called a secret meeting of Elizabeth's Privy Council, which agreed to send the signed warrant to Fotheringay. Sissel appointed the Earls of Shrewsbury and Kent to direct the execution, and the council agreed to keep Elizabeth in the dark until the deed was done. On the 8th of February 1587, Mary Queen of Scots was executed at Fotheringay Castle. Although Elizabeth was furious with her counsel, so much so that Cecil fled to his home and Davison was thrown into the tower, John Guy points out that whatever happened to Mary, whether she was assassinated or executed, Elizabeth could deny any responsibility. Guy writes, she had carefully contrived things so that she would win whatever happened. If Mary was killed under the bond of association, Elizabeth could disclaim responsibility. If Cecil covertly sealed the warrant and sent it to Fotheringay behind her back, she could claim she'd been the victim of a court conspiracy. Rather clever. So, this day in history, the 14th of October 1586, was the beginning of the end for Mary, Queen of Scots, who's a fascinating queen. You can find out all about her execution in my talk from the 8th of February, so I'll give you a link to that. Thank you for joining me. I do hope you enjoyed today's talk. You can, of course, uh, give me a like if you did. Um, you can subscribe to the channel by clicking around about there, and I would ask you to do that because it is so helpful. And uh, you can hit the bell to be notified as videos go live. But rest assured, they do come along quite regularly. I'll be back tomorrow with another Tudor history event for you. See you then. Bye-bye.